print an unlimited amount of money and basically, and, and until recently, in a non-transparent way, uh, give it to banks who are too big to fail. They can park their money, gain, gain interest on it, and at the same time, you have got businesses starving for cash in my area. Uh, there are some public policy questions. Go ahead. Well, right. I'm, my point was a lot of people, and I would subscribe to this view, say that there should be no such entity that can just create a trillion dollars out of thin air and, and hand it to rich people. That you don't need to say, well, who should run this organization? There, there wasn't always a Fed, you know. So if you're going to start questioning it, just go the go the whole way. Dr. Baker, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I th you know, the Fed was set up almost 100 years ago, and I think its structure reflects both the power of the financial sector and also the politics of 1913. I mean, it is sort of striking. We have t 12 regional Fed banks, and two of them are in Missouri. Um, I don't think anyone would set it up that way today. Um, the idea that you would have give the financial industry, the banking industry, a major direct say in monetary policy, which the structure of the Fed does. It is not just that they have advice. They basically appoint 12 of the 19 people who sit on the Fed's Open Market Committee, seven of the, five of the voting members. Um, I think that is really hard to justify. So I think having the entity that controls monetary policy, whether it is the Fed or we give a different name to it, I think having that directly answerable to Congress certainly makes sense. And, you know, again, one could think of how best to structure that. I, I for one, wouldn't say I necessarily want as much respect as I have for the members of the committee. I don't want the members of Congress directly setting interest rate policy, but the analogy I would make is to the Food and Drug Administration that, you know, we expect that they are answerable well, to Congress. But I, but I would tell you, back home, uh, people have, skept have skepticism of, and, and businesses have skepticism about letting the Fed uh, pass out, you know, free money to, uh, to certain interest groups uh, while well, businesses uh, and Main Street are starving. I mean, you know, that, that thanks. I, my time has run out. Thanks. I will go ahead. Uh, I just got one more question, then, but then I will give the uh, ranking member one more, uh, or another round if he would like. But um, did, uh, in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, Mr. Uh, Ronald McKinnon uh, from, the Stanford, from Stanford University, the Stanford Institute of Economic Policy Research, are you guys familiar with Mr. McKinnon? Yeah. Uh, wrote it, uh, what I thought was an interesting piece, I actually read it last night. Um, he thinks stagflation is, is, is coming, maybe here. Um, and he makes the, the, the comment, which I think strongly reinforces what Dr. Murphy and, and Mr. Reinhardt said, the Federal Reserve is the prime contributor to the current bout with stagflation. Um, so I just like your, we will go down the, the, the line here too, um, your thoughts on the piece Mr. McKinnon had in the journal yesterday and do you think that's where we're, this, this stagflation concept, do you think we're headed back there? My wife, Carmen, and I wrote a, a paper in August for the Fed Reserve Kansas City's Jackson Hole Symposium called After the Fall. And what we documented was after a severe financial crisis, economies grow more slowly than before than mm. for the entire decade, a point mm. and a half slower in the decade after a crisis than before the crisis. So the real macroeconomy is going to probably gr be growing only around the rate of growth of its potential. It's going to take a long time for the unemployment rate to come down. In that environment, we are probably in, in for us a spell of, of, of uh, subpar economic performance mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that we also lose the anchor of price stability, then that would be a, a, a double uh, dose of problems. I don't think right now the Fed will that will necessarily ha happen. The Fed can be responsible for price stability. I think it could have been more effective in its program of quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm not quite as pessimistic as, as Professor McKinnon. Well, in, in Mr. McKinnon's uh, article, he points to the same thing Dr. Murphy mentioned in his uh, testimony, the, the tripling of the money base. Um, and I, I don't see it offhand, but he made some of the same arguments. Dr. Dr. Murphy, your comments on Mr. McKinnon's piece? I, I actually haven't read that particular piece okay. yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been for a while very concerned about stagflation that the, what the, the policies, both the Federal Reserve and Federal Government policies the last few years that would, you know, slow real economic growth and also add uh, inflationary fuel. Um, if, if I could just, one thing I should have said before about the speculators, if I could just say one thing very briefly is, um, I just want to remind people that it, it can go both ways, that, for example, when President Bush back in, uh, I think it was July of 2008, announced that he was going to end the executive branch's moratorium on offshore drilling, apparently uh, oil prices dropped $9 during the speech itself. Okay, yeah. so that, that's what I mean, that when people think that there are future events that are going to affect the supply of oil, like that can drive prices. And, that's yeah, and, if, and, if, the, and if the Congress of the United States would, would pass 
legislation saying we are going to expand dramatically uh, drilling and exploration and, and, and get the resources that are out there, most likely that would have an impact on the price of oil, not in the, not in the 8 to 10 years that people say it takes to get the, the product to market, but when, the, when, the, when it's actually done, when the bill is passed. Well, right. Because in, the, in the way that happens, it is not that there is a time machine. It is that so if people, if, if, the, if U.S. Uh, policymakers expedite and, and give the green light so people think that U.S. production is right. going to be higher in the future, Sends a message. Then, yeah, right, then current producers with, with excess capacity like Saudi Arabia, they increase current output. So that Just like if we would actually cut spending and cap spending and send a message to the market, that might, might actually help uh, maybe, maybe PIMCO get back in the Treasury market and Standard & Poor's change their outlook, right? We, right. So, yeah. 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 It That's, sends a message. I mean, it is it, 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 of critical importance. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Murphy. Mr. Baker, on the on Mr. I get back to my first question, Mr. McKinnon's. Uh, yeah, I have column. to say I haven't read the piece, but I have to say I'm not very concerned about uh, the the process, the prospect of the inflation side of the stagflation. I mean, if you look at the inflation data, it almost all shows very low inflation. And in terms of market expectations, we actually know that because we have futures, uh, we have uh, Treasury indexed uh, inflation indexed Treasury bonds, and those suggest that the markets are anticipating one and a half to two percent inflation well into the future. So I'm not concerned on the inflation part. I am very concerned about bad policy giving us slow growth. And in the short term, I don't see any alternative to the deficits boosting the economy because the private sector is not about it. I don't, certainly don't see any evidence. Mr. Baker, let me ask you a question. If, if big government spending were going to get us out of this mess, don't you think we would have been out of it a while in, in light of the fact that for, for the last three years, that is all the Congress, all the administration has done, more spending, more spending, 20, almost 25 percent of GDP record levels haven't been there since World War II, quantitative easing policy, the tripling of the Fed's balance sheet. What, uh, don't, don't you think it would have done a little better job than it has? Well, I think that was the answer. I, I think it has done a job. I think that if you look at the size yeah, of the job it's done is we still got we still got eight percent un unemployment and in Ohio. It could probably be uh, ten or eleven. It was those actions. Well, it would still be absent those actions. We lost on the order of one point two trillion dollars in annual demand with the collapse of the housing bubble between construction and the lost consumption due to the disappearance of equity, home equity. So that is what we are trying to counter with that. The other part of the story, of course, when you look at trying to rebalance the economy, the only way I see to do that in the long term is with net exports, which involves a falling dollar. I don't know any other way to do that. I ran over my time three times in a row. Mr. Mr. Rank, you remember this will be the last round, but you can take as long as you need. Well, yeah, I, I want to uh, can I, can I no, go ahead. I, or, I, uh, uh, ask. I need to enter the uh, Committee on Oversight Government Report, the majority report, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to just begin by letting the Chair know how much I appreciate the fact that you called this hearing, because uh, what, what I, I, I note is interesting uh, is, you know, while the witnesses may have some differences of opinion, the fact that there is con concurrence uh, suggests that, a, um, that there may be uh, the potential for an alliance between conservatives in the House and those who are, are are not conservative or even liberal on, on some of these economic issues, especially with respect to the role of the Fed. That is not a small matter. And, 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 I, and I appreciate that you, that you called this. Um, Dr. Baker, could, could you take um, a few minutes to explain uh, the relevance of price inflation here and explain to us the relationship between the price Americans see at the gas pump and the supply of money? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, in principle, what you, what you can expect is that in ordinary circumstances, gas prices rise w with other prices. That is clearly not the sort of story that we are seeing today. So a conventional story of inflation driven by the money supply is that we throw out a lot of money, which we have done, and then in response, and this has not happened, you would see all prices rising more or less at the same rate. You mm -hmm. shouldn't expect to see changes in relative prices. So we see gas, depending on what we want to use as our starting point, but let's say we go back to 250 a gallon and now we're at four, we're seeing an increase on the order of 50 percent in the price of gas. We don't see anything like that almost anywhere else in the economy. We don't see that with rents. We don't see that with medical services. We don't see that with, you know, video equipment. I mean, pick whatever you want to look at. We don't see that. So that suggests that something qualitatively different, something that has really very little to do with the supply of money, is affecting the well, price. Well, play that out. I mean, so what does that suggest to you then? 
I mean, I know you have said this before, but so, uh, Well, so, so what I am saying is that it, it, on the one hand, you have sort of the fundamentals of the market playing a very important role, that you have had rapid growth in the developing world that is increasing demand for oil. That is going to continue. The second issue is this, the instability, which has to some extent affected the supply. It hasn't hugely affected, but to some extent affected the supply, the instability in the Middle East. That could turn out to be a major factor in terms of actually affecting the supply if it were the case, for example, that Libya's oil were to be uh, come off world markets, that we would lose the supply from there, or one of the other major uh, producers in the Middle East. And then the third factor is simply that we clearly have some speculation in the market. People are betting that prices will be higher and they are trying to take advantage of that and pick up the gains, and that at least temporarily pulls oil off the market, pushes up the price. I want to thank the Chair for and, and thank the witnesses for testifying, those who represent uh, trucking and businesses. Uh, you know, we appreciate your presence here. It's a, uh, I think the Chair has uh, created a forum here for an uh, important hearing, and I look forward to working with you to, as we continue to try to uh, find ways of letting our constituents know exactly what is going on and, you know, what we can do about it to try to take a, a new direction. Because certainly, and, you know, finally, one of the things that I have that I've advocated uh, immediately with respect to the um, extraordinary profits that these oil companies are getting in this climate, for example, you know, Exxon, I think they had a $10.7 billion profit in a single quarter. Extraordinary, like a 69 percent increase over the previous year, which is already pretty high, is uh, think about a windfall profits tax. You know, I'm, people have to make money. I got that, but but when you're gouging people, uh, you shouldn't get away with it. So we should we should look for ways, and that wouldn't be that wouldn't be to, on the, um, uh, the, the that wouldn't be at the pump. It would be on the profits. That's the difference. To try to find a way to discipline the oil companies so they aren't so they aren't stealing from our constituents. So. Well, I, I appreciate the Chair's opportunity to be here, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. I, I appreciate the Ranking Member's uh, comments and input and, and, and help with the committee. Um, just a quick response to the windfall profits uh, suggestion. Probably not going to go there, uh, as you would expect. But I have yet to figure out how raising taxes is going to lower gas prices. Um, I just don't see how that is going to help uh, Mr. Wanamaker and his business. I don't see how it is going to help the small business owners Ms. Kerrigan represents. Not uh, I, don't, price, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't see how that is going to help our economy. But I do want to thank our witnesses, um, uh, particularly uh, Mr. Wanamaker and Ms. Kerrigan coming and giving us a small business perspective and our uh, others on the, on the Fed role and on the broader economic concerns. Thank you for being with us. I apologize for, uh, again for, for having you as, have to stick around this late in the afternoon. But thank you for, uh, for being here today and giving us this valuable uh, testimony. And we are adjourned.